Hey, Margie here. Do you spend a lot of time reliving the past and just going back and seeing what you could have done different or what happened, as well as being worried about the future? Well, if so, you're really going to enjoy today's podcast episode because we're talking about the power of the present moment and how this can truly be life-changing. And our special guest is Duff McDonald. Duff is a writer, and he's written on a variety of subjects from business to culture. His stories have been published in Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, The Wall Street Journal Magazine, Wired, GQ, Time, and others. And he's written several books, including the best-selling book, The Firm, The Story of McKinsey and Its Secret Influence on American Business. But during quarantine, Duff started examining his life and discovered how he can bring joy and love into his life by starting to live in the present moment. And his recent book called Tickle discusses that, how we can embrace the present and how it can be so life-changing. So there's so many lessons to learn from today's talk. So stay tuned. Welcome, Duff, to the podcast. I'm so happy to have you here. And I have your book here that I just absolutely loved. And the message from this book is really life-changing. And not only can it make us a happier person, but it also can really affect our health. So I'm just really thrilled to have you and welcome. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So let's just start with the, the title, Tickled. You know, it's such a great title, but tell us how you came to that title and what exactly you mean by the word tickled. So uh, I was going into uh, quarantine. So early uh, 2020, I had intended, I was, I was going to write a different book than what I ended up writing. And um, the quiet of quarantine uh, and the lack of distraction sort of snapped me out of what you could call a dream state. I don't know. I, I felt I, a definite waking up of some sort where I realized that I was, had begun to pay a lot more attention to everything that I was doing, whether it was the taste of a meal, uh, the uh, book that I was reading, every book I read for weeks, I would tell my wife was the best book I ever read. And, or whether it was just going for a walk in the woods and I would notice uh, more animals than I had before. At one point I said to her, are there more animals around here? And then I sort of realized, I was like, no, I'm just noticing more of them. So the, the word tickled came to me when I was trying to get at how we can help ourselves, how I helped myself pay more attention to our own existence and bring more awareness to what's happening to us. And I started with, you want to focus on the things that bring you joy, right? It's easier to, to uh, maintain focus on something that makes you happy than something that doesn't make you happy or irritates you. And at that point, I thought, okay, what is a taxonomy that can sort of help explain this in a little more detail? And I landed on the tickle. So there's, I thought of four things. You want to feed your body, you want to feed your mind, you want to play with your body, and you want to play with your mind. Feed your body is literally feeding yourself. Uh, and the, when we really enjoy something we're eating or drinking, uh, we all say this. We've said it before. It tickles the tongue, right? A great tasting drink tickles the tongue or a food. Feed your mind is learning. When, when we learn a thing, when you hear something for the first time that makes intuitive sense to you, that sort of, you're like, oh yeah, no, that totally makes sense. That feeling is a tickle in your brain, right? When it's like, oh yeah, you're right. Uh, play with your body is move, right? Move your body. Uh, don't be sedentary. Uh, everything up to including, um, you know, sex. So, uh, and sex obviously in, 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 in one sense tickles. But so does movement, right? When you're exercising and you're in, in uh, really pu- pushing your body to, to move around and experience stuff. And then the final thing was play with your mind. And that's create. And I'm not restricting that to people who call themselves creators or artists or things like that. All of us create things every day. 
we bring ideas out of the void. We have, we, we think of great things to do when you, when you create something out of nothing, it feels good. It tickles. And so the point of those four tickles was to try to tell the readers, look, if you can, if you feel any of these and we all feel them every day, uh, we don't pay as much attention as we could. When you feel it, grab it, hold it. And what you, what is underneath that is what I call the tickle of existence, which is the thing that makes you happy to be alive. So tickled itself is basically, I suddenly realized in quarantine, oh my God, I don't have any problems or the problems I thought I had are no longer important to me because I suddenly stumbled on the glory of my own existence. I was like, this is amazing that this is even happening at all. And the tickle is sort of the way to handle that. You know, I'm such a believer in there is, even when we're going through challenging times, there's always a lesson and a gift. And you certainly got that gift in terms of being in quarantine. And you said a couple of interesting things, but first, firstly, in terms of being in the woods and not noticing the animals, I think that really is a metaphor with life. So often we just go through life and we're so wrapped up in our head and what we're doing that we're just not paying to all paying attention to all the amazing things around us because we're distracted. And in this population that I work with, I see it as a problem because people could be people fall because they're not paying attention. You know, they're not paying attention crossing the street. They're worried about 30 million things going on in the future. So I think that these concepts that you teach in the book pertain to just so many areas of our life. But let's focus on living in the moment because so often people are in the past, they're in the future. And you found, and you really explained it so beautifully in the book, the value of the present moment and just being. Sure. Uh, one of my favorite writers that I've discovered in the wake of all this is a, was an Indian uh, thinker and sage, his name's Ramesh Balsakar. And he talks about the distinction between the working mind and the thinking mind, right? Our minds are obviously hugely valuable to us. We figure out how to do stuff. We, we take in some sense data and make some decisions in the moment. That's the working mind. The thing that's sort of helping you just sort of do the things you do as you do. Then there is the thinking. And all my life, I spent most of it up here. Uh, I was a creature of the intellect. Uh, I spent more time thinking than doing. And I think what we have, uh, certainly for me, and I know I'm not alone. Uh, I think in the West, we have overvalued thinking at the expense of doing. And so what happens to, this happened to me my whole life. And as you say, people who fall, it's when you're engaged in some kind of activity and there is part of your awareness that is not focused on, it is distracted. That is the thinking mind taking part of your awareness away from the matter at hand. And in the book, I talk about the fact that I suddenly had this realization uh, and I'm not the first to say this and nor will I be the last. I was like, oh my gosh, time isn't real. And what do I mean by that? What does everyone mean by that? It's, they mean that the past is gone, right? So you can't actually point to the past and say, there it is and go touch it and change it or do anything to it. It's sim at, it, at this point, anything that's happened to you in the past is simply an idea, right? And it, there's nothing you can do with that. The future is an even flimsier thing because it hasn't happened yet. So the future is ideas of things that may or may not happen. So when we spend part of our awareness or, or dedicate part of our consciousness to dwelling on the past or, or having anxiety about the future, what we're doing is taking our, that piece of our awareness away from the only thing that's real which is what is happening to you right now. There is nothing else. And I had some thought exercises about this. It's like, is it ever not now? No, it is never not now. And can you do anything in the past? No. Can you do anything in the future? No. Can you do anything somewhere else other than where you are? No. 
the only thing you can do is put your focus as much as your awareness as you can on what you are doing right now. And the rest will take care of itself. It always has, it always will. And what we've done when we get up all in our heads is we think that there's some work to, we have to do that isn't right here, right now. I need to think about this thing that maybe is coming down the pike in a week or so. You know, of course, there's things that we're planning that you have to, if things are put in process, of course, you have some obligations, right? But dwelling on a thing that has already happened or hasn't happened yet and sort of wondering too much about it as opposed to simply doing something that you might need to do with regard to it, that's where our mistake is. We distract ourselves from the matter at hand and we end up not being as aware as we could and we slip on that banana peel because we didn't see it because we were thinking about what we're doing this Tuesday. Yeah, this is just so important because the body doesn't know what's real and what's perceived. So being worried about the future is going to cause the same negative effects on our body as if we really have a tiger right in our midst. I mean, that's the thing. It has, and it has so many negative effects on your bones, your overall health your immune system, your digestion, you know, everything stops because the body thinks you're in, you're in stress and it just thinks there's more important things to be done. So it's, it, it, it's such a, it, it's, you know, it's just so important and it's so life-changing as you say, and you really describe that beautifully in the book when you do live in the present. So what suggestions do you give people? Cause there are people listening, yep, that's me, that's me. And, you know, I'm a person that also teaches a happiness program. And I noticed I, I ride, I love going in the woods and riding my bike. And there are times where I'm working on something else in my head and I miss, I miss everything. I mm -hmm. miss the relaxation. I miss the enjoyment. I'm like, I ruined the whole ride by being in my head. So I really try to, you know, really absorb it and soak it in and just be as attentive as I can. But what would you, what are some steps for the people listening? Like, oh, I'm just a head person. Like where, where would you suggest people start or what do you have? Where do, what, what are your, some of your good steps that you can share with people? Okay. So number one is the tickles uh, that we spoke of. Focus on the things that make you happy and hang on to that feeling. I don't mean to indulge. Like that doesn't mean go get a huge pile of chocolate and shove it down your throat, right? It's like when you get that feeling of how wonderful it is to be alive, pay attention to it because that's the thing. That is, that is. You are bordering on presence when you feel that, right? The other one, and it's, it seems so simple, but it's challenging. But if you pull it off, it, to me, as far as I'm concerned, it's the answer. Pay attention to what you're doing, right? So we, we tend to think when we overvalue the intellect that we must be thinking about things, right? But if, if you're sitting on the couch and suddenly you realize you have to go to the bathroom and you get up and you walk into the bathroom, you're not sitting there going left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, right? There is, there is a part of you, the working mind that knows how to do stuff. It doesn't need the input of the, the mind or the ego to instruct it. And I would argue, and the Eastern mystics argue the same thing, that your entire life can be lived simply by paying attention and you, you will do what's in your nature, right? So if you pay attention, and also the other thing is there's no real downside to this suggestion, right? If I say to you, the best way to be more effective at what you're doing is pay attention to what you're doing. I'm not asking you to distract yourself. I'm not asking you not to dedicate focus to something important, which is the thing you're doing. I'm telling you, try to gather all of your attention, all of it. Stop when you catch yourself. I'm divorced. Uh, I got divorced 10 years ago and I used to have, uh, I didn't talk about this in the book. But I used to have these theoretical arguments with my ex-wife in my head where it wasn't even a real place or time. It was just she and I would be discussing a thing and she would finally understand that I was right about everything. <laughs> and I suddenly in 2020, all around the same time, I caught myself having 
one of these conversations. And I said, what am I doing? Why do I do this? I'm going to stop doing it. And then the next time it happened, I said, there it is again. I'm going to stop doing that. And in time and not very much time, they stopped. So you can catch yourself. So back to the paying attention to what you're doing. If you catch yourself in the moment, not focused on the thing that you're doing, take note that you've caught yourself and make a pledge to yourself. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to worry about next week. I'm not going to worry about this thing that I cannot do anything about right now. And when you, it's basically like catching yourself, distracting yourself, chastising yourself, you know, lightly and gently. I'm not doing that anymore. And in time, and it's worked for me, your focus, you end up centering all your focus on what you're doing. Then here's the outcome of that. It's almost axiomatic to say that the more aware you are in any given situation, the better decisions you will make, right? It's hard to argue with. Them. So if you bring more awareness to everything that you are doing, you will make better decisions about everything that you do. You will be more effective at those things. And that will have its own flywheel effect of releasing tension. So you deliberately try and release some tension by saying, I'm not going to worry about this thing that may or may not happen. Bring all your awareness to what you're doing. And when you do that, you get better at the things that you do because you've got more of the inputs. And that will release the sum of the stress that we bring on ourselves because we know we're not performing up to our potential. And the reason is because you're distracting yourself. So if you stop distracting yourself, better performance, you feel better, everything starts going a little more smoothly. And to me, the, the, the lesson there is a lot of self-help uh, talks about things you should do. And in, you know, in things like bone health, there can be diet, right? You should eat more of this and less of that, right? These are things we've learned and we know them to be true. But in simply your own sort of mental state and, and self-care of the mind, I think it's less about things you should do and more about things you shouldn't do. If you stop distracting yourself out of your own existence, things will flow more smoothly. You will be in flow. And the tension that gets released from that, the burdens of you thinking that you have to have some kind of oversight over yourself, uh, you know, um, second guessing your thoughts about things you've already done or, uh, you know, um, whispering in your ear about, are you ready for the thing next week? Are you ready for the next week? If we can quiet that, then you'll, you'll find that you already know what you need to do. If you would stop talking over yourself and distracting yourself. And so to me, the, uh, the, the, this journey, it's been three years and they've been the best three years of my life because Everything's getting easier and it's getting easier because I am letting go of some sense of responsibility that I thought I had to my own existence that was actually just a mirage and just let life happen. So stop distracting yourself. You'll be better at what you do. And things just kind of get easier from that point forward. Wow. I, I love, I love this on so many levels because, you know, I think, just giving ourselves permission, even just doing that, just giving ourselves permission and realizing it's getting us nowhere. It's not helping in any way, shape or form. It's only increasing our stress and actually really reducing our happiness as well as, as our overall health. So when you realize that, you know, being in the past, you, you can't change it. Just like you said, the past is the past. And it's only going, there's, there's nothing positive about that. And worrying about the future isn't going to make it any better. So I think that's, you know, just giving yourself permission to live in the present. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're so, we are so distracted. And I think this is a society, I know I used to do 10 things at once, you know, oh yeah, it's great to multitask, to be on the phone, to get this done, to do this. And I realized the worst, the worst, most stress producing thing in the world is multitasking. 
versus being totally present and 100% engaged in the activity. So for everybody listening, what you said, these words are so important and they, it, it really is life changing. And I know that I, you, I used, I used to listen to music when I read books and I did, I saw no problem in that at all. Right. I like music. I like reading. Why not do both at the same time? And thought that I was reading senses, but in, during this whole process, there was one day I said, you know, maybe I'm going to read in silence. Even that kind of multitasking was compromising my ability to understand the things I was reading because I was distracting the brain. I'm with you. I used to think if you could handle several things at the same time, then that just meant you were a higher performance uh, person, right? That you could keep track of three things at once. It's not true. Multitasking is a fool's errand. You want to focus on the one thing you're doing with everything you have, right? And do it as to the best of your ability. And then everything gets better because of it. It's not like we don't, uh, again, I don't think time is real. So one of the reasons we multitask is we think we're short on time, right? There's only now. There's only what you're doing. It's the only thing that's real. So focus on the thing that you're doing and everything else A, will take care of itself and you can get to the other things when the time, it, you know, when it's their time. Absolutely. You know what? It's so interesting because I used to eat with the, you know, I have the television on, with the news on, with the newspaper, you know, making sure I get all my information. And that was the worst thing I could possibly do. I totally wasn't enjoying my food or really, really tasting it. Or, you know, you just kept eating because you were distracted with everything else. So it just, it fits in every part of your life. So I, I couldn't agree more. So what other things from the, I mean, the, the book is so great. And I love your journey where you started and the type of person you were. Maybe you want to share that just a drop. You know, wh- wh- what type of person you were, I mean, you've shared some things to where you are now but in terms of how this has been just so transformative. But what other lessons would you, okay. would you share with people? What would you say were the biggest lessons that you could impart to this audience that maybe, or, or things, action steps they can take? You've given some, but what else? What other sure. great? I got, I got another one that answers both those questions. What, what kind of person was I? Like, I was a business writer uh, and journalist for my entire career. Uh, I'm 51. And so 30 years, roughly 30 years of writing about business. And when you write about business or the economy or Wall Street, uh, it should surprise no listeners that it tends to be numbers heavy, right? When we think of a business, how's it doing? Well, how are, how are its sales? Are they up? Are they down? Is the economy, is it bigger? Or is it smaller? What is the employment? Are we up? Or are we down? And I realized. Uh, all in a flash, that uh, our tendency and obsession to quantification, we count everything uh, as a culture when something big happens and we are trying to understand it. Our first instinct almost always is to count something. COVID's a great example. The amount of COVID data that was generated, uh, most of which was not really informative to the majority of us and sort of useless to us, um, was a perfect example of when we don't understand things, we try to count. But counting can't get at the essence of it. What do I mean by that? When you ask yourself, am I healthy? Sure, you could weigh yourself, but the number of your weight, so call my weight right now, 190, right? If you say, when I tell you I weigh 190, because numbers are inherently empty, right? They only contain themselves. And I know that sounds a little weird, but I think I can explain it. It's like, if I say I weigh 190, you immediately think, well, is that good? Is that bad? Are you up or are you down? Do you want to weigh 190? Do you want to weigh less? Do you want to weigh more? And so the, 
basically raising the, the, the point that it always depends. Numbers need context. So when we count everything, we distract ourselves from the thing itself, right? So when I say, am I healthy? And I say, well, what do I weigh? Uh, numbers can only get at a superficial attribute, right? If, if you say to me, how old are you? I tell you I'm 51. Does that tell you anything about me other than that I'm 51, right? And we say, how am I, how's my career going? We count our bank account, right? All the counts that we do, we think we deceive ourselves into thinking they contain meaning, but they don't really. And so I, my piece of advice, which I started doing myself, which is very hard after a career counting things, is I created a litmus test, right? So we are deluged with numbers every day, right? As soon as you open a newspaper or turn on the radio, have a conversation with someone, numbers are coming at you all the time. And I realized that there's two kinds of numbers, those that are meaningful to you and those that aren't. And the way to distinguish between them is to ask yourself, is there something I should or shouldn't do as a result of this number. Can I do, is there, does it tell me to do something or not? Right? So if you, people are coming over for dinner, you say, how many people are coming over? You want that number because, um, you need to set the table, right? But if somebody tells you that, uh, the rain today was, there was one inch of rain versus uh last year on this day there was the half an inch of rain those are not useful numbers unless you're going outside and you know planting in the garden right so we count these things for no reason when someone tells you that the gdp of america the economy grew by three percent last year what are you going to do with that nothing you can't do anything with that ergo it's a pointless number. You do not need to focus on pointless quantifications of things. There are things that will be relevant to you. How much money do we need for this trip? And you need to, you know, of course, right? There are things that we count because we have to. How far do we need to drive? How much gas is in the car? But then I would argue that the vast majority of numbers that we, are, that we deal with every day are useless pointless and a distraction from the thing itself. So piece of advice, stop counting everything and stop letting other people who count things force those numbers on you as if you're supposed to care, right? What you want to care about, again, is what you are doing right now. When someone says employment is up, Employment is down. Em employment being up or down matters to you as a person, generally only in the regards of whether you have or don't have a job, right? Otherwise, dwelling on the state of the economy, it's a, that's a source of tension that is not of any use to any of us. Uh, so that's my main one from the book. I let go of a career's worth of um counting everything and thinking that the way to tell a story was to use numbers, to realizing that numbers are a distraction from essence, they can't grasp essence. And uh, the more we count, the less we're aware of what's happening to us. So just like the, uh, my point before of like, if you catch yourself having a future conversation with your ex-wife, if you catch yourself mulling over numbers that have no real meaning to you, try to, try to put them in a new file in your brain. Say, I'm not going to pay attention to those numbers. And you will find that, or I think people will find, because I did too, I did myself, right? If, if when we, t the weather's a great example. When they talk about today being the hottest, you know, um, uh, day, uh, in the last six months, except for this other day, right? That's not useful to you. What you want to do is see what the temperature is, see what clothes you're going to wear. You don't need to compare it to anything. When we compare stuff, 
and I guess I can stop talking here in a sec. When we compare stuff, and I make this point in the book, uh, especially when we compare each other, right? I have more money or less money. I have more likes or less likes. I have, you know, more, any of those things. Um, the fact that each of us exists, any of us, is a miracle. It is a straight up miracle that you were conceived in the first place and that you're still here today, right? And you could go back in time and say, for you to be conceived, both your parents had to be conceived and for them to be conceived both there. So you're basically an infinite miracle. The, for you to be here, an infinite number of things had to happen perfectly. Otherwise, you're not here. So we're all infinite miracles. What are we doing comparing miracles to each other? They're all miracles. Stop comparing yourself or some other person or some anything and realize and refocus on the glory of it all. And I, that there's an underlying religiosity and spirituality here, which I fully intend to be communicating. It is so wonderful that we exist. We should be thanking the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, for the fact that we're having this conversation. It's a straight up miracle. And when put up against that, all these things that we count and say that number is not good enough, we're, ha we're having a scale. We have a scale problem. We're comparing the wrong things to each other. We should focus on our own miracle and be happy about it and just know that everything's going to take care of itself. Always does. It always will. So, such good advice. And it's truly in the book, you talk in detail how it transformed your life. But are you a totally different person now than you were? 100%. Yeah, that's what's that's went, what... so quarantine, quarantine got quiet. Things got quiet. And I had a moment in, I remember it well, because I sent a note to a, a mentor of mine in April, 2020. I said, I feel like I broke through to the other side of something, but I don't know what it is. It just feels like that. And everything seems clearer. And the clarity, I would argue, is the result of the removal of a burden. Right. I didn't think something through and figure it all out. Right. And I, nor am I here to tell anyone, oh, I know more than you do about how you should be. Right. Because I don't even know you. So I, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the fact that what I experienced was it, this basic lightning of my overall existence. And it's like, oh, like you said, you can surrender. You can let go of a bunch of things that you have assigned to yourself without even being aware of it, right? So this idea that you have to worry about the future, who gave you that assignment, right? You did, right? This idea that you have to think about things that you did and judge yourself and say, I should have done that differently. Who is the judge? You. Who has appointed the judge? You. You can fire the judge. You can, you can basically take all these parts of your psyche. It's, it's essentially your ego and, and dismiss it from, dismiss them from their responsibilities. And which leaves you, you know, in the end, in the final analysis, with the mere act of being, right? Being itself is a miracle. Back to what I was saying, right? And so what we tend to do as a culture is we sit here in the midst of this miracle, we're quibbling with our own performance, right? Instead of staying focused on the miracle. And I'm not saying you don't want to learn, you know, I shouldn't do that. Or, you know, I should pay more attention to this kind of thing. Of course, I'm saying not to dwell on uh, things because dwelling on anything, once again, is a distraction from the matter at hand. 
And so what happened to me is when that all suddenly I sort of snapped out of a trance in early quarantine. And it turns out that everything gets easier uh, when you stop judging yourself. Everything gets easier when you stop counting everything around you. My God, think of the, it's like if, if we never had to count another thing again, how much easier would life be there? Oh, that's not going to happen, but you can probably stop counting the things that you can. And, you know, I have a 14 year old daughter and during, uh, uh, COVID during quarantine, uh, I, I thought I was a good father, right? I'm attentive. I love her. Um, we have good communication. Um, but something happened where I realized, uh, I was like, oh my gosh, I wasn't quite paying as much attention to her as I could have. I started catching the littlest flicker, you know, of disappointment or fear or something in her that I wouldn't have noticed before. And so I started being able to catch myself in something that I said where I'd be like, oh, wait, no, I didn't mean that or uh see something that i hadn't seen my relationship with her improved so profoundly uh the best as you know part of this whole thing was realizing that the love i had for my child was i was not caring for that love as much as i could and for you know you don't it, it can be love for anyone, right? It can be in a relationship or what have you. You want to, um, like, you don't want to do someone the disservice of not caring about them enough to pay attention to the things that matter to them. And I don't think people do that consciously. I think people just get wrapped absolutely. up in their life yeah. and don't realize that's just something, you know, that just happens as a result of it. Yeah. And again, it's all because of the distractions. Yeah. Right. And it's like, you know, let's say you've got, you have a job and there's a thing that is going to happen tomorrow. There's a meeting and you're worried that so-and-so is going to, you know, criticize your project or, and it's sort of stressing you out. Right. My, my suggestion would be, unless there is something that you need or can do about it right now then you put that part out of the thinking mind, right? Because thinking about a thing that is or may going to happen, right? Right. Um, unless it, you're working through like in a constructive sense, if you're just stressing about something, you're not paying attention to what's happening to you. So you're not going to see that look in your wife or your husband's eye. You're not going to see that your child is actually afraid of the thing that you think that's excited about. Like, and it's all about distracting yourself with the thinking mind. I'm not saying that you should, that we should not pay attention to things that are coming down the pipe. I'm saying use that attention when, and if it's necessary, otherwise you're squandering your awareness and your effectiveness as a human being. And, uh, what, again, you know, back to what I said, it's less about I, my, my thoughts for people or suggestions for people are not, you need to do this because I don't know you, I don't know what's going on, in you. but I can certainly tell you that I know that we all share the capacity to distract ourselves. So the, the more we can do to stop doing that, the better job we can do about at being us. Right. And you can let your nature do what is in your, you can, you will do what is in your nature without distraction. And, um, the way I see it, and I didn't really talk about this in the book. I, I now think of the universe as a perfect possibility machine, right? If you think of a forest, it's a great example. Everything kind of works together, right? the animals, the plants, the rain, the soil, the everything, uh, you know, unless humans get involved and start messing with stuff like a, a forest knows how to be a forest. Same with us. We're not separate from it. We are part of it. And the, the less we distract ourselves, the more obvious it will be for you in any situation that you're in. 
what the right thing to do is, what the thing you should do is. And um, it all gets easier. It all gets easier. I couldn't agree more. And then you actually get signs and... You know, I'm very big into, into when you're open to things. It's amazing what happens when you get well, you into see, this flow state. So it, I, you I, see I, the you see the interconnectedness of everything. You yeah. stop thinking of yourself as separate and you see your role in the things that happen around you and you see your most appropriate role. And you stop thinking so selfishly because in the mind, right, if you're in the mind, you're in. You're all in the what you think is going on. And as, as we all know from v various instances in our life, you don't always know what's going on. You are always missing some information. A lot of the time because you're too busy dwelling on the thing that you think. So the less you can distract yourself with, that, the more you see all those connections. They, it's like they light around you and you see, oh, this is why I met that person because this was the thing that was, and you see that it all fits together back to my point in a perfect possibility machine. If we could just get out of the way of the machine and let it do its thing, we would see that this, that the universe is pretty well designed. And it doesn't really need you to override it as much as we tend to think it does. Wow, I love that. And there's just so many lessons in the book. But before we end, because we could talk for hours, because this was such an interesting book. And, you know, you take the readers through where you were and your journey. And it's, you know, really quite miraculous from one part to the end. But I just want to end with I, your last chapter. You talk about, so what tickles you? You know, so you want to give like one tip of something people could do to tickle themselves? So uh, a couple of years ago, I was saying something to my wife about the state of things. I was whining about something and she turned to me and she said, you need a hobby. And I, at first I was just totally offended. I was like, how dare you? I got lots of hobbies. And then I thought about it and I was like, reading isn't really a hobby listening to music or going to see music isn't really a hobby. Those are pastimes. Those are things that uh, any of us can do. A hobby is something that you dedicate your focus to and maybe pick up some craft and technique and that kind of thinking, right? Like how to, I'm jealous. I'm a, I'm, I wish I was a musician, right? It's the one if I have a regret and I don't really have regrets, it's that I should be on stage playing guitar in front of thousands of people. But it like what a hobby, what a hobby does is it gives your thinking mind a constructive place to go. So I picked up, uh, I discovered kombucha five, six years ago, started buying so much, it threatened to break the bank. So then I decided to start making it at home. And it is my first official legitimate hobby of my adult life. And uh, it was a little shocking to realize at the age of 50 that I had, other than like the thing I did for my career, that I had no skill or craft in anything else. But my, the amount of time, so I have 10 gallons going in the other room here, brewing at all times. And the amount of enjoyment that I get out of wondering about it and thinking about what flavors we're going to make and thinking about whether we should use a different cut shape of bottle. My wife just made us some labels for ones that went for the bottles that we make at home. And that is a very constructive use of your thinking mind. That isn't just anxiety about things that may or may not. So, um, like one of the greatest and in retrospect, most obvious lessons. So back to the tickles, right? Find things that make you feel the glory of existence. Find the things where it's like, oh my God, it's so amazing that I even get to do this. Uh, if you don't have one of those things, start looking for one because they're all around you. And um, we all have a different, constitution. We all have a different background. We all have a different makeup, right? So 
the thing that gets you going is going to be different from the thing that gets anybody else going. Um, but you will find those who share uh, those things and find that thing and just jump down that rabbit hole because uh, it allows you, again, to hang on to the beauty of it all, right? Oh, wow, I know how to do this. I get to do this. I'm getting better at doing this. Wait, how, what if we did it this way? Wouldn't that be cool? And you end up pushing your mind into the realm of possibility, right? So I said the universe is a possibility machine. You are the universe. We're all the universe. So you're a possibility machine too, right? If you get too stuck in a groove and only do things a certain way, life's going to get pretty boring. It does for all of us, right? Where we're like, I need to do something new. When you figure out uh, something that really energizes you, uh, it's a way to harness the power of possibility and sort of get it running through you, become a channel for it. And it sort of gets you again, sort of engaged and locked in to the awesomeness that is the fact that any of this is even happening at all. So if you don't have a hobby, find one. And if you do have a hobby and you've been um, not giving it the attention it deserves, go back to it. Um, do things that bring you joy because that's the whole point of this. The point of this is not to be talking smack about other people and how they're so disappointing to us and talk about how no one else understands it. I wrote whole entire books criticizing people. Looking back at it, I'm like, what was I doing? Um, the point of this is to enjoy it, right? Find the things that help you do that, focus on them, and share it and share the joy with other people. Share the tickle, right? That things that tickle you. Tickles are contagious, right? They're like laughs. Remember when you're a kid? It happens to us when we're adults, but when we're a kid, when it's like a laugh runs around the room like a virus, right? Tickles are contagious too. If you are tickled, you will tickle other people. And it's going to make everything around you feel a whole lot better than it did before. Oh, I love that. And just a real quick thing. We met because of, of um, our mutual kombucha friend, <laughs> Hannah Crum, introduced us. So that's, that's sort of funny. Anyway, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's so important. You know, here it's 2023. And just what lights you up? You know, you need to live like that. And, and you know, that's been so great. Well, I can't thank you enough. How can people get in touch with you or follow you? What's the best way? Uh, so I've got a website, theduffproject.com, theduffproject.com. Um, I am on Instagram. I think it's Duff McDonald. Same thing on Facebook. Uh, if anyone actually wants to have a like direct one-on-one -on -one conversation, they're welcome to email me. It's duffmcd, D-U-F-F-M-C-D, mac.com, M-A-C. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about any of this. One of the one of the things that came out of the whole tickled experience in the writing of the book is I realized that uh, in addition to this sort of advice, focus on what brings you joy. My focus now is on this discussion because uh, from where I sit now, it's the only thing that matters. How do we center ourselves in our existence in a way that it's enjoyable? So if anyone wants to talk about any of this stuff, hit me up and uh, let's do it. Thanks for having me. Oh, well, thanks so much. It's been such a pleasure and I appreciate you taking the time. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Duff as much as I did. And I really hope you take some of the things he said and put them into practice because they can make such a big difference in the quality of your life and your health as well. One of the first places I think to start is just living in the present. All the links stuff talked about will be in the show notes. So thank you so much for tuning in. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.